few weeks now, we have been engaged in a series of messages with the goal being to focus our hearts and minds on what Scripture might say about building momentum. Momentum is not a static thing. It's not always easily measured, but you know it when you have it, and you know it when you've lost it. And our desire as we follow Christ, as we walk in the Spirit, as we abide in this revelation, in God's Word, as we do that, we want to be progressing in Christ and for Christ. And that is often done more easily as an individual believer because you get to follow Jesus as one sheep, one lamb following one shepherd. But it becomes a little more complex when we move as a flock. Because as a flock, some will be more eager to move at one pace and others will move at a different pace. And yet we're all called to follow follow the same shepherd in one direction. And so ultimately we have to discern as the followers of God corporately, as a local church, in this instance most particularly, Meadow Baptist Church, we have to say shepherd lead us. And he only has one direction for the flock. And so that means it requires an incredible amount of heart submission and uh, petition and desire to say, first of all, God, show me where you're taking us. And then, Lord, empower me to lead and to bring others with. And of all the messages that may sound like a do this message, this is it this morning. A lot of them have been about God's part in building momentum. But I wanna remind you of the byline of this sermon series. It's called Building Momentum, and the byline is this, sometimes God is waiting on you. And so this morning, if you will excuse me ahead of time, I want to challenge Christians. This is a message for believers. If you're not a believer in Jesus Christ here, I'm gonna tell you, I've got a secret. I know God's will for you. I know God's will for your life if you are here today and you're not a believer, and that is to call upon the name of the Lord Jesus so that you may be saved. I don't even have to pray wondering if that's God's will for you. That is God's will for you. And at any time in in our time together this morning, you can release yourself by faith to Jesus. He's never turned to anybody away that comes to him honestly and openly wanting him as Lord and Savior. But for those of you that are born again, Those of you that have already committed your lives to Jesus Christ, I want to bring you a message that I've called Reclaim the Flame. And this is for maybe a large group. It could be a small group. Quite frankly, the Lord knows, not me. But it's for people who sense the dimming of their heat, their fire, their flame, their passion, their glow, their effectiveness, their power. They've seen it fade. They're losing touch with it. They're they're beginning to wonder if their best days are behind them and they're listening to the wrong voices that are answering and saying, yeah, your best days are behind you because that is not true for any of us in this place. But the reality is, is that we do know a little bit more than we want to about the ebb and flow of walking with the Lord. And I want to tell you today that there is a distinct call on our lives to reclaim the flame. I'm going to be bold this morning. Some of you need to stop asking God to give it back to you. He's telling you, take it. He's telling you, you can be as close as you want to be. You can be as on fire as you want to be. You can be more powerful in ministry and global kingdom effectiveness than you've ever been. Stop asking me for it and just start receiving it. And so um, we stand around here in the initial reading of scripture. If you're physically able to get to your feet, I'm going to ask you to stand as we read just a few verses this morning out of 2 Timothy 1. And I don't want you to think about anybody other than yourself this morning. I want you to think on Jesus. I want you to think on you. And I want you to just ask the Lord in a moment here, Lord, just show me what's in this for me. What do you want me to learn? What do you want me to do? 2 Timothy 1, look in verse number 5. Paul says, um, I'm reminded, Timothy, of your sincere faith. A faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice. And now I am sure dwells in you as well. 
For this reason, I remind you, here we go, fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me as prisoner, but share in suffering. I'm just going to say that again. This is, this is not just Paul to Timothy. This is God to me and you as believers. Share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began and which now has been manifest through the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Look up here for a second. We will never get done with these verses today. I'm just letting you know ahead of time. Not going to happen. I'm just, I'm feeling churned already, and I haven't even gotten to my, my first point. I just want you to, to, say, to say this morning to the Lord, I'm going to pray out loud for all of us, very short prayer. I just want you to tell the Lord this morning, God, whatever's in this for me, I'm going to receive it. Just tell him that. Make a commitment. You're not asking for anything. You're making a commitment to the Lord. Lord, whatever is in this for me, because there is something for you here, just say, Lord, I receive it, okay? You pray that while I just pray out loud for all of us. Holy Spirit, the soil of our hearts is under your tines. Rotate it up, dig it up, make it ready for the seed of the word and let it bring forth really good fruit for the name of Jesus, amen. Be seated. When you reclaim something, it's an indicator that it, you once had it, and you've, you've lost your hold on it. And so when we talk about reclaiming the flame, we're, we're, we're speaking in spiritual metaphor. We're talking about you gaining again, receiving again that which you know you once had. And it's kind of the elephant in the room because a lot of you could stand up and you, we're not asking you to, but you could testify, Jeff, if, I, if I'm just being honest before Jesus and before anybody else that cares to listen, I'm not where I once was spiritually. I'm not as intimate with the Lord. I'm not talking about what you used to do so much. That'll come, but I'm talking about where you were with him. It's about being. And and there's a thousand reasons why we can say I'm not there anymore, but I don't really really want to go there. I don't want to get bogged down in that. I'm just asking you, do you believe that he can reignite it? Do you believe that he wants to? Do you believe that he wants to for you? And do you believe that he will do it to the degree that you confess that you want to receive it. Well, Paul's talking to Timothy, and Timothy is an incredible study. I love the relationship between Paul and Timothy. Just to give you a very brief snapshot background, Timothy's not a a kid. He's he's in his 40s. He was um, a disciple of Paul. Paul came into his life when he was younger, Acts chapter number 16. Timothy was a a strange kind of believer. He had a father that was a Gentile, a mother that was a Jew. His grandmother and and mother got saved. And then Timothy believed the gospel, and Paul took him under his wing. God said, Paul, I want you to invest in this young man. And so Timothy was a disciple of Paul. And by the time Paul's writing this letter, Timothy is pastoring. And and Timothy, I'm just going to say it like it is, is not pastoring with boldness. He's not pastoring with confidence, godly confidence that we talked about a week or so ago. He's pastoring with timidity. He's pastoring with hesitancy. And he needs the man of God, Paul, to come and say, Timothy, you've got everything you need. Use it. And so that is the the angle that we're looking at in chapter number one and verse number five. First, Timothy, Paul is saying, Timothy, your faith is serious. Timothy is not a false believer. He's the real deal. He says, Timothy, I'm reminded 
of your sincere faith. The Holy Spirit moving Paul qualifies Timothy's faith as genuine. It's saving. It's sanctifying. It is stimulated faith. It has been serving faith. It is not an intellectual belief in God or an intellectual assent to the gospel. Timothy has been converted. He's been transformed. He's a new creature in Jesus Christ. His sins are gone. He is the temple of God. He's indwelt by the Holy Spirit. And that faith, Paul goes on to say, is real and sincere. I love the fact that it, Paul gets historical on Timothy. He's saying, Timothy, I saw that faith in, in Granny Lois. And Timothy, I remember your mama, Eunice. And I know where you got your faith, son. It was taught to you by your mama and your grandmother. And then Paul adds this statement, and I don't have time to go into a Greek lesson, but in the Greek, it's very emphatic. Paul's saying, I am absolutely double down, convinced and assured that your faith is real. That faith dwells in you too. So we're not dealing with some mamby-pamby kind of on the fringe, in and out kind of believer with Timothy. He's a real believer. Now, why is that even important? Because what we're about to read are words written to people that are genuinely saved. And so if Timothy, a pastor, a third generation Christian in the first century, which was pretty rare, by the way, a man who's truly saved, who has a solid testimony in the eyes of the apostle Paul, if he needs to be stirred up, if he needs to be loved and provoked unto good works, if he needs his flame fanned, then let's humble ourselves and say, you know, I might be a good candidate for what's about to be said. I might need it too. So let's go further. Serious faith. Let's talk about stoked faith. Stoked faith. The metaphor that's going to be used is a fire. It could be some of you had your first fire of the year this weekend in your fireplaces and you know, stoking has been something you did this weekend and you're poking around in there, you're keeping it stirred up, you're keeping it hot, you're keeping it lit. Um, we could also picture a torch if we want to, but look in verse number six. Paul says, everything I'm about to say is attached to what I just said. Because you are truly saved, for this reason, Timothy, I remind you, I want you to set your mind on this, Timothy. What is it? You, Timothy, need to fan into flame the gift of God that is already in you. Now, the reason why this is crucial is because many times during whatever you want to characterize a, a season by, whatever term you want to use, backslidden is overused, and I think it's a little, little ill-defined. But if you can look at a time in your life and you know that you have kind of migrated away from intimacy with God, if your passion has waned, if there is a, a, a sensible, a sensation of distance between you and God, maybe it's an issue of you're not passionate about the kingdom, you're not passionate about him, you, you're not passionate even in some of the disciplines that used to help you in your walk with Jesus, you're not passionate about the church, you're not passionate about the lost. As a matter of fact, the best of your passions could be being kind of sucked out of you and deposited into other aspects of life. In other words, well, I give all my energy and work to my, to my, uh, my job. Or, you know what, I'm trying to raise kids, and I'm trying to get them to the ball field, and I'm a, I'm a professional carpooler, and, you know, we got to run here, and we got to run there, and, and I can't give unto the kingdom because I, I'm in debt, and, and all of my resources are going to temporary things. And, and so often we don't really lock into those realities. We just learn to live with them. And meanwhile, week after week, month after month, year after year goes by, and, and we're saying, I've learned to live with a very low flame. And so sometimes we say, God, I, I just, I need you to do something. And by the way, I always encourage you to pray prayers like that, because God likes to do something. But sometimes he's saying, okay, my child who wants me to do something, let me just tell you, I want you to do something. And look at what happens here. The onus is placed on Timothy. Timothy, you have a very specific gift. I believe Paul's talking about a supernatural, spiritually endowed, 1 Corinthians 14, Romans chapter 12 uh, kind of gift. I believe that that's what Timothy, uh, Paul is referring to here. It is an endowment for ministry that Timothy received via the laying hands on, on the hands of the presbytery, specifically the apostle Paul. God endowed Timothy with a ministry gift and Timothy was not utilizing that gift or he was underutilizing that gift. Uh, I'm going I'm to run some trails in this, so I'm going to need you to be really focused in this. I, I want to affirm each of you in this place that are, are, are saved by God's marvelous grace. 
when he saved you, you became the tabernacle of the Holy Spirit. That means you have the Holy Spirit indwelling you. That is a theological, biblically asserted truth for every Christian. That does not necessarily mean you're walking in the fullness of the Holy Spirit. That doesn't mean that you're being fruitful in the Holy Spirit, but it does mean that you are the tabernacle, the temple of God, and the Holy Spirit lives with you. And Scripture teaches that he came bringing gifts. And so you're not only indwelt by the Holy Spirit, but you are gifted by the Holy Spirit. So if you're saved, I want you to look to the person right next to you. I want you to say this right now. Did you know I'm gifted? Would you do that? Would you do it? Come on. You're gifted. Now, that's not a pep rally speech. That's not to butter you up. That's a theological truth. And if you don't believe that, then you won't be living out and and utilizing that gift. Some of you are are doubly gifted, maybe gifted uh, in in, in triplicate. You, you, You have many gifts. But God wants you to use a predominant gift for his son's glory. And so often... We minimize spiritual giftedness to very little more than than a public talent. Your giftedness spiritually may be in in conjunction with your natural talents, but it's not the same thing. Otherwise, if we don't see a, a, a wealth of natural talent in somebody, we could have the wrong conclusion, well, they're not very gifted. That's not true. Most gifting, mark this down, most gifting in the kingdom is lived out behind the scenes. The backbone of kingdom ministry, New Testament ministry, local church ministry, individual ministry is not done in the spotlight. That is a smidgen of it. Most of it is lived out behind the scenes. Now, what do we do with this? The Bible seems to be indicating here by way of Paul's counsel to Timothy that there is a certain level of responsibility in me and you to keep our gift flaming, to keep it fanned into flame. Interesting. I mean, Jeff, if it's God, won't the flame just burn? Apparently not. Now, look, I believe as strongly in the sovereignty of God as anybody in this room, but I'm also reading my Bible very plainly. And Timothy, the pastor, the man who has sincere faith, is being told by the apostle who has prophetic insight into his life, Timothy, your flame is going out. And he didn't tell Timothy to fast and pray over it. He actually told Timothy, you need to fan that flame. It's in you. You're not asking God to give you something you don't have. You're asking, uh, God is asking you to flame what he has already given you. I'm gonna, I want you to think about this. Some, some in the body of Christ, and I, I don't know who and I don't know where, and you're not the only one listening to this message. There's people listening online. There'll be people that'll listen on television. And so I want you to understand, this is not an accusation. It's an observation here. That some of you are unhappy in the kingdom because you've stopped using the gift that God gave you so that you might experience fulfillment and purpose in the kingdom. You got discouraged, you got sidetracked, somebody didn't validate you, somebody didn't affirm you, or an area where you were using that gift got cut off from you and you went into the spiritual non-gift of poutiness. When God was gonna use that obstacle to bring you to another place where that gift could be used. Instead, you just stopped where you were using it and you let the flame die. And, and this is the graciousness of God. God says, all right, I, I'm sending you this not to, not to uh, defeat you or discourage you, but to let you know that if you will fan the flame, I'll provide the wind. Some of you might be depressed this morning because of a certain football game in Jacksonville yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a Georgia fan. I was for the first quarter yesterday. Watch this. The team brought the playbooks. The team brought all the equipment. The team brought all the staff. The team even brought some fans down there. Let me tell you what the team didn't bring their game. You see, we've got the book, we've got the crowds. We've got the fans, but brothers and sisters, if we don't bring our game, we're going to get run up and down the field of the kingdom all day long, and the other side's going to keep winning. And so God is saying here, sometimes you just got to quit staring at the playbook, and you've got to recognize, I've got to use what I've already gotten. So this stoked faith is followed up by an explanation of verse number seven. Watch this. Here's where we begin to see what the problem is with Timothy. It's not that he wasn't gifted, it's that he was timid. Verse number seven, 
Timothy, God gave us a spirit. Now just watch that. That's, that's, that's enough to, to help us as Baptists just to slow down and think for a moment. That you're a spiritual being who happens to have a body. Not a body that crams in a little spirit. You're actually a spiritual being. And the spirit who is in you is God the spirit. And God the Spirit comes with giftedness, and with that giftedness comes expectation, and that expectation is that our lives are being lived out in full joy and satisfaction, but intentionality of purpose. And the Spirit that God gives us, it it, it merges with our human spirit. And now we start seeing about how we are to view life and how we are to view the world. The Holy Spirit harnesses your human spirit, and when we are yielded, we will develop a mindset an attitude, um, an approach to life that is consistent with the character of God. But watch this. If we step out of that flame, if we step off of God's ways, if we step around his expectations, we are left merely with the, not, not the theological presence, but the practical presence of the human spirit alone. We have distanced ourselves from the purpose and work of the Holy Spirit. You follow me? And so what does that result in? Well, for Timothy, it resulted in a spirit of fear, timidity. It's a word that indicates a lack of courage, a lack of confidence. And God, uh, Paul is saying here, for those that are operating in the spirit of fear, mark this down, it didn't come from God. Now that is a bold statement, meaning If you are living in insecurity, if you are living in an approach to life and ministry and koinonia, the corporate family life of the body of Christ, if you are afraid, if you are defensive, if you are self-protective, self-preserving, if you are constantly having to wrestle the spirit of trepidation and uncertainty, someone other than the Holy Spirit has you under harness doesn't mean you're not saved. Remember to whom this is written. This is written to a believer, a believer who was struggling with being fearful. Why is that important? I think it's important on a lot of levels, not not the least of which is that we live in troubling days. Paul would go on in this letter to Timothy and say, hey, Timothy, man, you think it's bad now. It's going to be way worse at the end of the age. Paul never gave us a license to live in fear and uncertainty and insecurity. Um, Based on other things that Paul would say to Timothy, and really the first and second letter to Timothy, we find out that Timothy was just hesitant to be who God had made him to be. And I love you enough to tell you that some of you are committing that same error. You're living in fear of what other people are going to say about you. You're living in fear of how you might be labeled. You're living in fear that your best won't be good enough, therefore you even smother the good that you have, because it can't be the best. Brothers and sisters, I want want you to know, when God created you, you were so on purpose, it's pitiful. You were not a a side thought, a random thought that God had in the midst of an infinite amount of other thoughts that day. You're an, you're, You're an expression of the purpose of God. Who you are, how you were framed, where you were born, to whom you were born, when you were born, your physical appearance, your, your nationality. We have probably 15 to 16 different nations represented in this congregation. I just want to tell you something. God loves our nations all the same. We have probably six or seven different races represented here. Just want to break it to you. God loves people and it don't matter what the color of the skin is. And so we can, we can live in this defensive posture and we can live in fear. And this dovetails with what I said last time we were together. When when changes start happening, watch this. When changes start happening and your knee-jerk response is, oh no, I don't like this. Oh no, I'm afraid of this. Oh no, what's going to happen next? Now listen, there's a logical process where we're curious about these kind of things. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the, uh, uh, um, excuse me, the instinctual, emotional, oh no. And immediately... Your mind is filled with negativity. Immediately, your skepticism rises. Immediately, your cynicism and self-preservation gears start grinding. Whatever was going on with Timothy, it was to the extent that Paul knew it was affecting his capacity as a leader, and so he had to write him a letter. Let's, let's look at this. He doesn't give us the spirit of fear, but what does, what does it look like 
when we're walking in the Spirit? What does it look like when our human spirit is, is under submission to the Holy Spirit, to God the Spirit? Well, it's a lifestyle here defined in verse number seven as a lifestyle of power, dunamis, a Greek word that indicates power. We get our word dynamite or dynamic from that same root word. And so I, I, I'm going I'm to get you to do it again, partly because I'm not sure some of you are awake, but I want you to look to the person next to you and say, I'm a powerful being. Go ahead and say that. Now say it with some conviction. <laughs> Again, it's not a rah-rah speech. There's got to be a time in our lives where we start not only reading the Word of God and memorizing the Word of God and studying the Word of God and speaking the Word of God, but time out, let's believe the Word of God. Let's start saying if he says it, it's actually true. And so if we walk around all the time, well, the devil's got me down today. I tell you what, this is just another day. I'm going to write it in my journal, another day where the devil won. Um, I, I tell you what, I can't win. My boss, my boss just says, she owns me. She runs the route. I just, I'm never going to make it. I don't know what I'm going to do. Will you pray for me? Please pray for me. <laughs> and and we, start, we start talking more about the sovereignty of that which is coming against us. And we, we forget, we get spiritual amnesia. We forget that God is sovereign over that which poses to be sovereign over us. And we have power. But that power is not independent of our willingness to believe it and walk in it. And this is why we are saved by grace through faith. Faith is not just what gets you to heaven. It's what gets you through today. And so if we are walking around defeated, well, I'm just defeated. I don't know what's coming next. I don't know how I'm going to handle it. That's the spirit of fear. We fear what we can't control. And since we hate fear, we try to control everything. And God wants us to fear God and nothing else. And so God will allow Goliaths to pass their shadow over you so that you can take off Saul's armor and recognize that's not going to help you. By the way, I'm preaching next Sunday sermon. I better shut up, but that's where we're going next week. But, but, but we strip off Saul's armor and you say, God, Goliath is nine feet tall and this situation in my life is nine feet tall and it's barking and it's blowing and its wind is blowing out my flame and I don't know if I can do this. And God says, I've given you the spirit of power. And lest we think we're going to get reckless with that, I love the counterbalance, but that power is housed in love. So it's not a brutal power. It's not a self-serving um, power. It's not an arrogant power. It's not a, a, a boastful power. Listen, the power of God never struts. It, it's not a check it out, look at me power. Check out my stats. It's not that kind of power. This love, this love is a love, it's the agape love of God. It is a love that takes all of that power and, and, and turns it outward and says, how can I use it for Christ's glory and for others' good? That's what our Christian life is about. We are about the glory of God and the good of others, and we have power. And when you merge your life with that purpose from God, I wanna tell you, you will start experiencing the power of God that you cannot experience when you're living for yourself. Because God doesn't squander his power on our selfishness. But when we step out of ourselves and we start saying, I'm going to be about the kingdom. I'm going to be about the king. I'm going to be about the great commission. I'm going to be about helping my neighbor across the street. I'm going to be about serving little babies and, and, and changing their diapers and teaching little kids how to sing on Sunday morning and, 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 and being, the, being the example in the neighborhood or being the example at school. When I step out of myself, all of a sudden I realize this, this is the power. This is the, the sense of fulfillment. This is the reality that I've been searching for, but I've been looking for it in the wrong places. Um, I, I started praying two years ago for a God to baptize me in his love. And I really didn't even know what I was asking for. I just knew that um, my heart, as, as it had been up to that point, was not going to be sufficient for the rest of my life. The, the way I describe it is I had tapped out my capacity in my heart. I felt like I had hit a brick wall in my love for people. And if I'm being really transparent, I felt like I had hit a brick wall in my love for God. And nothing I was doing in ministry was working. And this was the same time when Amy had gotten in that horrible collision and um, God took ministry away from me for quite some time and gave me an opportunity to learn how to love and serve my wife. And it was during that same time that I was just, God, I, I need to love more. I just, I don't want to go through the motions anymore because my flame is really low. And Lord, I'm tired of missing the flame and 
and, and sucking in the smoke. And so I started praying for a baptism of love. Don't get nervous with that, okay? Baptism is a word that scares people, but he has not given us a spirit of fear, amen? Um, I, I, what I'm saying is I needed to be immersed in the love of God in a way that I never had before. And I'm so glad I began to pray that prayer, and I still pray it, because he's changing my heart, and friend, he'll do the same for you. I think the, the difference is, is it, everybody wants progress as long as it doesn't entail change. Somebody write that down, because that was really good. <laughs> Lord, we'd love to see some great dynamic shifts and some awesome, awesome works in our lives and our family and our church. And Lord, we, we really want to sense your presence. And God, we want your power. We want to see souls saved. And we want to take the gospel and advance it to Europe and Africa and South America and Asia. Lord, we want to do this. But please don't ask us to do anything differently. It's tough to hear, but listen, if we really slow down, that, that is the way we kind of think sometimes. God, we don't mind you doing an overhaul of our life as long as it doesn't affect me tomorrow at noon. Well, I'm only on the third verse, I told you. Power and love and self-control. And by the way, I believe in context when, when it says that God has given us a spirit of power and love and self-control, the self-control is, is kind of um, inclining us to this thought that you're in charge of some things. Don't say you can't do it. Don't say you can't change. Don't say, well, I'll just, I don't know how to fan the flame. Um, you're not a pawn. You're not helpless. I mean, you're indwelt by the sovereign God of heaven. And, you know, we, our, our little kids quoted, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And so the self-control, it's called a sound mind in, in some translations. But what it means is you've got to make up your mind about some stuff and you can do it. Well, let, let's jump down to verse number eight. Serious faith and stoked faith and then stamina faith. And wow, here we go. This is where we're going to talk about doing. Paul says, therefore, don't be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord. He just told a pastor that. That's messed up. Don't be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord. And then Paul adds this, and don't be ashamed of me either, Timothy. And Timothy, here's what I want you to do. I want you to share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. Do you know what Timothy was doing? This is not a stretch. Timothy was playing it safe. That's exactly where Timothy's error was. Timothy was letting people despise his youth. He, he, he was afraid to ever rebuke an elder, and so Paul had to tell him how to do that when that came, that there was a certain way to do it, but it came with the job description that sometimes you gotta deal with people, Timothy, that outrank you and outage you, but you do have to do it. Why? Because you're the pastor, Timothy. You've gotta do this. And Timothy didn't really wanna do this stuff, and so he's, he's kind of in this paralysis of being afraid to do anything that needed to be done. And when you, when you get to that place, by the way, if you're a leader in this room, hear me on this. When you get to the place where you're afraid to do anything, then you're not a leader anymore. You're just not a leader. It doesn't matter what my title would be or where my office is. If, if I'm just standing around saying, well, let's just play it safe. Well, let me just tell you something. The Lord moves most of the time. Sometimes he'll stand still. But even in standing still, he's doing something. And when we can't discern the times and we don't have the spirit of the sons of Issachar who knew what was going on in their generation and we just stand still and we're afraid to do something because it's going to cost us them we're not leaders by the way you don't have to be a leader for that to apply to you because sometimes you're going to be afraid maybe not in leading but maybe in following and the Lord is going to say to you that it's time for you to move let, let me just ask you about this when we talk about stamina faith look at what Paul says here he says, don't be ashamed of the message of the testimony, pardon me, <coughs> about our Lord. Does anybody know where Paul was writing this letter from? He's in big trouble. Paul stayed in trouble. Um, ah, I, gotta be, I almost got carnal there for a minute because I was going to, and I'm just not going to do it. But there's, a, there's certain preachers that tell you, you know, if you're in the will of God, everything's going to be great. Everything's going to be great. Everybody's going to love you. You're going to have divine favor. You're going to, and all of this stuff. And, and sometimes being in the will of God, well, you'll forfeit your freedom. You'll forfeit your money. You'll forfeit your reputation. You'll forfeit your family. You'll forfeit your life. And Paul was saying to Timothy, as Paul had been suffering greatly for the gospel, 
Timothy, you're over there pastoring. You've got your freedom. Don't be ashamed of Jesus. Can I speak just a word into your lives? Hey, don't, don't be ashamed that you're, you're saved. Don't hide that. I studied for, for two days in Matthew 5, 14, 15, and 16 this week. And God doing some, some forgive me for weaving personal testimony in this, but God's doing some, in my opinion, revolutionary work in my heart. Work that I've sought for years and years and I'm experiencing now and I don't know what to do with it. And I'm so hoping that it'll translate into our ministry here and, and, and seeing God break forth in a way that Meadow's never seen, but that's for a different day. But, but where I was was uh, the hiding the candle under the basket and a city being set on a hill. You know, when you read that, Jesus said, a city set on a hill cannot be hid. And our immediately thought, our thought is, is in perspective and logistics, we think, right? It's elevated, it's a city, it's big, it can't be hid. That's not all Jesus was saying. He was saying when a city is visible on a hill, it's also vulnerable for attack. Why? Because everybody sees it, and if they want to conquer the city, they know right where to go in it. And so pairing that metaphor, the city set on the hill, you can't hide it. You can't keep it in secret is what the Greek word meant. You, you can't play it safe. You've been set on a hill through the blood of Jesus Christ. You've been elevated out of the world. You've been illuminated. You've been cleansed. You've been washed. You've been set free. You've been pardoned. You've been made new in Christ Jesus. You've been given the very life of God. You're a brand new creation in Jesus Christ. You're going to live forever. You're indwelt by God. You're an overcomer. You're more than a conqueror. You are victorious in Jesus. You can't hide that. You can't play it safe. There's going to be some people that are going to come full throttle bow and arrow after you because they hate the fact that you've been positioned by Jesus as a city on the hill. They hate the fact that your flame is burning, your light is giving, your power is ebbing forth. They're going to hate that. And God says, Jesus said, you can't hide it. Paul put it this way. Don't you be ashamed. Don't you be ashamed. You and I will do a lot better when we spend less energy worrying about what people think and a lot more focus just living what God has said. Uh, sometimes stamina faith is also stigma faith. I spent some time with a brilliant man this summer, not one-on-one, -on -one, but in a very small group of people up in North Carolina. Uh, he's 80 years old. He's a unique man in our generation. I believe God's going, we're going to look back on his life when he leaves this earth and say that God did something through R.T. Kendall, that's the man, who uh, when he was alive, nobody really understood what was happening. But R.T. Kendall looked at me and he said, Jeff, you're asking God for great things in your life and your family and the church you serve. Are you willing to bear the stigma? That's not the question I wanted to hear. I wanted encouragement. I wanted, you can do it. <laughs> and I didn't get that. And when an 80-year-old man who was the pastor at Westminster Chapel in London looks you in the eye and says, are you willing to bear the stigma? You don't answer quickly. And I'll ask that same question to you. You want the power of God on your life. You want fruitfulness for the king. You want abounding ministry fruit and souls and influence for the glory of Jesus. You want your kids to, to walk the, the path of Christ. You want your grandkids. You want to make an impact on your community or wherever your sphere of influence is. I'm just going to ask you this. Are you willing to bear the stigma that comes with it? Paul had to tell the pastor, don't be ashamed of the Lord or me, but share in the suffering for the gospel. I'm not even going to unpack this. I really thought I would, but I'm not going to right now. But I, I'm, I'm going to mention something. It, 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 isn't, it isn't proper. <laughs> it's not equitable for you to benefit from the gospel and it not cost you anything. It's, it's not... It's not appropriate. I'm just using normal human terms. It's not right for you to receive and not respond. For you to receive the sacrifice, but to deny the sharing of the suffering. 
Salvation is paid for by another. He paid it all, and it cost you nothing. But kingdom advancement costs you everything. And so if our mindset is that we're here to receive our ticket punched for heaven and then live our life and then go to heaven, I worry for a mindset like that. But when we're being renewed and transformed in the renewing of our mind and the spirit of our mind, and we recognize, oh, everything that I am, everything that I do, and everything that I have can have a kingdom benefit, that's where we're starting to connect with the king himself. That's where the flame starts rising in your life. And so we get down to the end, and I call this signifying faith, and it's signifying in the sense that Christians view our standing in grace, not simply as this ticket punched for heaven, but I I view my, my, my faith, my standing before God as a royal position and the plan of God. You, you may not like this, and I forgive you for being wrong, but I'm going to tell you something. I, I'm royalty. I am. I know you're not used to somebody saying that. I'm going to just tell you something. My, 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 my father is the king of the universe, and I'm his boy. And that, that didn't happen on accident. He actually sought me down and, and, and washed me off and adopted me and said, sit at my table. You're not my enemy anymore. You're my boy. And so you can go on with your unroyal mindset. I'm just going to believe what God says. And, and to say, if I am royalty, then I'm going to live in a royal fashion. You say, well, Jeff, that sounds arrogant. Well, you're not hearing me right. It's anything but arrogant. It's called grateful. Glory to God, I'm about to do a holy dance by myself. (laughs) Listen, let's get this. When we're talking about signifying faith, how we are living signifies what we truly believe about Jesus Christ. If you, and I'm not being ugly here or, or disrespectful, but if you were a mute and could not testify verbally about who Jesus is to you, what would your life say? If we couldn't sing his songs, if I couldn't preach his messages, what would our lives say in this area of sharing in the gospel and sacrificing? See, how we live signifies what we believe. The scariest chapter in the gospels, Matthew chapter seven. Jesus whisks us prophetically to the judgment. And there's a group of people that are waiting to get in. And the Lord's not letting them in. And they panic. And they say, well, Lord, we we preached in your name, we prophesied in your name. Lord, we had a deliverance ministry, we cast out demons in your name. And Lord, everybody could tell you, I mean, bring them up, there's witnesses. We did many wonderful works in your name. And Jesus said, I don't know who you are. I never knew you. Brothers and sisters, let's let the sober moment hang. Forgive me if it's a buzzkill. But how we live and why we live, not just actions based on Matthew 7, but adoration, our aim, our direction. That reveals what we believe about Jesus. Not coming to church on Sundays. So in verse number nine, Paul says, don't be ashamed of Jesus, verse eight. Share in the suffering of the gospel by the power of God because it's God who saved us and called us to a holy calling. Not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace. Boom. Boom shakalaka boom. I mean, this is good. His own purpose his own purpose, his own purpose. Look to the person next to you and say, I am a purpose. Do it. I am, not I have one. That's good, but you are one. You're an expression of the purpose of God. And this purpose was ordained before you ever drew your first breath or had your first heartbeat. He he gave this purpose to you in you, through you, before the ages began. You see, he's he's always had a playbook, and you're on one of the pages in there. 
Not accidentally. Not lost in a crowd. You are precisely written in for a time such as this. So why in the world are you letting your flame get so low? So I don't know. I just wish God would do something. No, stop wishing for God to do something and repent and start fanning the flame. Start fanning the flame. Why? God has now manifested through the appearing, verse 10, of our Savior Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. You see, the gospel just sets you up, sets you free, and sets you out. And so God is working all of this and has been working all of this and none of it is random and none of it is accidental. And so if you're finding yourself in this cooling off period where your light has dimmed and your heat has been replaced by a spiritual chill, when you find yourself more capable of pointing out what's wrong with other people and other things and in your church and in the kingdom and in politics and you've become this person who's doing this and doing this and doing this and you're wondering why you don't have joy, it's because you're ignoring the problem. The problem is not that you're pointing your finger and you're upset with people, that's the symptom of the problem. The problem is you lost your flame. And so God's saying today, reclaim it. Lord, how do I do it? The same way you got saved. What was that? Knowing your need, believing his offer, humbling yourself and say, I receive it. The process doesn't change. Whether it's being saved, being born again, or whether it's recommitting your life to Christ, whether it's acknowledging that you've lost your your flame and you've sidestepped your purpose and you're missing out on weeks, months, years, decades of life, the, the, the remedy is the same. Jesus, forgive me. I I trust you and he will restore you. Amen. Give him glory this morning. Hallelujah.